All right, well, welcome and happy Pride. Happy Pride. Uh, so obviously the topic uh, today is why we rock. And uh, obviously I'm not just here to talk about why I rock, uh, but also why my family rocks. Sarah, Heidi, Beatrice, Betty, and Gerard. And it's not just why my family rocks, but why gay people and lesbian people rock. And not just gays and lesbians, but why bisexual people rock. And not just bisexuals, but also asexuals. Why asexuals rock. Not just asexuals, but also two-spirit people. Why two-spirit people rock. And also just transgender people generally. Drag queens, drag queens, genderless, bi-gender, genderqueer people. Why they rock. And not just them, but also questioning people. People who just need a little bit more time to figure things out. Why they rock. And uh, also allies. Why allies rock. You'll notice um, a lot of familiar drawings in this presentation taken from, this is this, I consider this the sequel to the last year's Pride presentation, the LGBTQIQ2SAA Labyrinth. And so there's a lot of, actually all the images are borrowed. I wasn't very creative this time around. And also pictures taken from my personal story, Meet Calvin, so you'll see a lot of familiar things. And this was the snapshot of the LGBTQIQQ2SAA Labyrinth, and just a picture of all the kind of diversity that exists out there. And, and just to recap, I'm not going into this here, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, intersex, queer, questioning, two-spirit, asexual, and allies, and a whole lot more that aren't fitted in that acronym. But I wanted to remind you that when I'm looking at the big picture of sexual and gender diversity that I don't like to leave out two massive, massive groups of people that are too often overlooked in the big picture, and that's heterosexuals, people who are attracted to people of the opposite sex, and cisgender people, that is non-trans people, right? people whose gender identity matches their biological sex. I just don't think that we should leave them out of our basic understanding of sexual and gender diversity, yes? Um, and, um, and also, I, I advertise this talk as um, simply, stick people, simply explaining the obvious about LGBTQIQ2SAA folk and everyone else. Because honestly, the things that I have to say about us, they could apply to just about anybody, and um, we're going to see that as we go through. This isn't just something that's limited to why we rock. Okay? And in the LGBT Labyrinth uh, presentation that I did last year, I also took a look at some statistics. Uh, you know, Things like uh, the very high rates of uh, depression in the LGBT community, high rates of substance abuse, um, high rates of suicidality, low rates of self-esteem, low self-esteem, that leading to things like poor sexual health decisions and complications that come from that, um, and of course the uh, pervasive discrimination and the many, many forms of discrimination that are faced by members of this community, including allies. And so after I went through that, we looked at strategies for change. Because these are important. And the first one, and the most important one being, recognize that we rock. And then after that, I went through, you know, I actually filled the rest of that page with things like, you know, uh, support from family and friends, positive responses to coming out, identifying with the LGBT community, having respect, having self-awareness, providing se inclusive sexual health discussions, using inclusive language, having no assumptions, leaving room for ambiguity, and being good. These were all on the list. But today, we're just here to look at that first one, to go deeply into that. Because honestly, if we get that one right, then all of the rest of them will fall into place. So I want to go into this today in depth. I'm going to go through, I decided to make a list of 10 reasons why we rock. <laughs> Number one reason why we rock is just because, to me, just because is the number one reason. And honestly, do I need to explain any further? Like I say, I'm here explaining the obvious. Because who's to say that we don't? If you look into my eyes, can you tell me that I don't rock? And if you look into my wife Sharon's eyes, can you tell her that she doesn't rock? When we first met, uh, one of the first conversations that we had, I asked her, well, if she could be anything, anything in the world, what would she be? You remember what your answer was? 
Rock star. Rock star. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, well, awesome, you should be a rock star. And she said, oh, no, you need talent for that and stuff like that. She does actually have some talent. She, as, a, as a white rapper, she's a really fantastic she can. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, so, and it gets you thinking, you know, she, she, you know, she is a rock star. She really is. And it's when you shed the expectations of what you should be, shouldn't be, that that's where you discover your inner rock star. And personally, I think that that's what makes a rock star out of every one of us LGBT folk, shedding those expectations of what you should or shouldn't be. And also, with the just because, who doesn't rock, honestly? When you look into, when you look into the lives of others closely, have you ever met somebody who doesn't, on some level? That's my experience. So again, these, it's not just to LGBT people that these things apply, which isn't surprising at all, because I've said many times before that people are no different despite their differences. There's not some strange thing that applies to people in the LGBT community that is distinct from everybody else. It's, we're all the same. So if we rock, so does everybody else. Um, and also, I don't know how many people were here for the piano playing part, but what I did was I chose a song to represent each of the categories that I chose and, and how they relate. And the one that I chose, the first one that I played for this just because was Rainbow Connection. I think we all know the Muppets and Kermit the Frog and all of that. And I never actually really understood the lyrics to that song. I don't know if you do, but it talks about rainbows and lovely things. Um, so I actually just chose it just because. Not necessarily because it relates to anything. But at the same time, that idea that what applies to us also applies to everybody else. Uh, that that's a rainbow connection, isn't it? And I'm hoping that that's one of the things that we can discover during our time here today. That connection that we all of us share. The rainbow contains every color, not just the queer ones. Reason number two is that we have suffered. And this is, you'll notice some of the drawings from my Meet Calvin presentation here. The, uh, this is a bit of a challenging category because it's hard to really say why this is a reason why we rock, right? And for this, Category, I chose the song uh, Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles. Uh, look at all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? All the lonely people, where do they all belong? And I know where a lot of them come from. Right. And many LGBT people have experienced rejection and isolation and terrible loneliness so much love interrupted. We have been hardened on the anvil of experience. A few of us come out broken. Most of us come out refined, a little chiseled perhaps, but with a strength of character that has been forged by fire. It's like the hardening of metal. I don't know how it happens. First it's weak and pliable, and then it becomes a hundred times as strong as it was before. There's a, a really neat um, uh, documentary kind of uh, video, YouTube video, by a philosopher named Alain de Botton, a British uh, Swiss philosopher, and it's really brilliant. Uh, and in this segment of the documentary, he talks about Nietzsche, which is a famous, brilliant philosopher. Nietzsche on hardship, and I thought that a lot of what he had to say applies to us and to this situation. He points out that most philosophers uh, try to look for a way out of suffering, but Nietzsche didn't. He was quite different. Nietzsche believed that all varieties of suffering and failure were to be welcomed by anyone seeking happiness. We should regard them as tough challenges to be overcome in the same way as a climber might tackle a mountain. It's at the top of the mountain that come the finest views, but it's of course extremely hard to get to them. His view is that to reach anything that's worthwhile, to reach anything that's valuable, you have to go through an extraordinary amount of effort. 
to quote Nietzsche directly, to those human beings who are of any concern to me, I wish suffering, desolation, sickness, ill treatment, indignities, profound self contempt, the torture of self mistrust, and the wretchedness of the vanquished. And um, <laughs> it's a little hard. I don't know if I would go so far as to wish it on others. But ironically, fortunately, we don't have to wish it on others because all of us suffer. And out of great suffering comes compassion. Those who have been intimate with suffering feel the suffering of others. And so it is a foolish family, a foolish community that does not embrace its most compassionate, those most acquainted with grief. So Jesus, um, whether you regard him as a historical or a literary or a spiritual figure, it doesn't matter. He is the embodiment, he's considered the embodiment of compassion. And he's described as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. So suffering and compassion are intimately related. But, as Nietzsche pointed out, suffering alone is not enough. All lives have hardship in them. What makes the difference is the way in which hardship has been met. The challenge is to learn to respond well to suffering and to grow out of it something beautiful like a gardener. Which takes me to the next reason why we rock, which is that we have overcome. For this reason here, this category, I chose the song Chariots of Fire, because isn't that just the perseverance overcoming song of all time? You don't even need words. It was from the uh, 1981 movie Chariots of Fire. It was big. It won all kinds of Oscars and such. And actually the plot of it, I haven't seen it since I was a kid, but the plot of it was, was uh, included one of the runners in that movie, running, Chariots of Fire, running, running, da 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 da, da. One of them was a, a Jew who was running. Uh, this was uh, during, I guess, the uh, around a, a time where there was a lot of anti-Semitism uh, due to the war and such. He was running um, to fight against prejudice and anti-Semitism. So something about that the song and that perseverance and fighting against homophobia, transphobia, and things like that—it just, it just felt right. And also that chariots of fire, right? That idea of being forged by fire. Those who overcome become resilient. And it's like, it's like a body uh, that's been exposed to viruses and bacteria. If it fights it, then the immune system grows stronger. You grow plants, if you grow plants, you know that the ones who have been exposed to winds and extremes of temperature, and when they overcome, when they survive, that they're stronger, stalks are thicker, and the leaves they endure so much more. And it, it's true that not all of us overcome. Not all of us. Just as not all plants survive winds and temperatures, and not all bodies survive the onslaughts of infection. But as long as you're still here, just as I'm still here, just as all of us are still here, then you're still overcoming. So persevere and keep fighting. You don't take for granted what you've had to fight for. It's like Nietzsche's analogy of climbing a mountain, to reach the best views, that to reach anything that's valuable, you have to go through an extraordinary amount of effort. But it's not the view itself that's valuable, is it? It's the quality of the eyes seeing it. You can take a picture of the view, you can take it down the mountain and show it to everyone. But what do they care? Is true beauty can only be appreciated by the one be appreciated and taken in and savored by the one who has fought for it, by the one whose eyes have been lit by the fires of seeing. So when you've had to fight for your family, fight for your friends, and fight for your self-worth, as so many of us have, then your eyes have that quality of seeing. 
you, your friends, and your family might be the same as they were before. Nothing might have changed, but if you fought for them, then your eyes will have that quality of seeing that can appreciate, take in, and savor their true beauty. And when you know through experience, which is the most direct form of knowing, how easy it is to lose, we treasure what you have. We treasure what we have, and that's one of the reasons that we rock. And the next reason that I listed here is that we know how to love. Love is not a feeling, it's not attraction, it's not sex, it's not attachment or dependence or desire or any of these things. Love is relationship. It's a quality of relationship. It's true relationship. So what does it mean to know how to love? It's connected to everything I've been describing here. The valuing that comes through an extraordinary amount of effort. Love is not easy. It takes tremendous energy. Love is a constant fighting for what you have. Love knows how easy it is to lose, and it doesn't take for granted. Only the eyes that have been lit by the fires of seeing know how to love. In the film Avatar, I'm sure we've all seen it, the native Navi people greet each other by saying, I see you. It's not superficial seeing. It's deeply connecting yourself with the other. In order to love someone, you must see them as they are. There is nothing superficial about it. Love makes no demands that you be this or that, or that you be what I want you to be. So a family or a community that demands conformity what does it know of love? A family that loves you will see you as you are and recognize the beauty of you. And the LGBT community is such a family. Everywhere I go, I experience this. This connectedness, acceptance, openness to seeing, and a celebration it's not one man and one woman and maybe kids that make a family. It's love that makes a family. And for that category there, I chose the song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. <laughs> and I want to read you a few of the lyrics because they do apply. And it goes that the road is long with many a winding turn that leads us to who knows where, who knows where. But I'm strong. Strong enough to carry him. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. So on we go. His welfare is my concern. No burden is he to bear. We'll get there. For I know he would not encumber me. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. If I'm laden at all, I'm laden with sadness. That everyone's heart isn't filled with the gladness of love for one another. It's a long, long road from which there is no return. While we're, on, while we're on the way to there, why not share? And the load doesn't weigh me down at all. He ain't heavy, he's my brother. And to me that expresses love and the kind of family that comes with love. And I want to compare that also to people of LGBT Lanark County, you know, who give so much of their time and their energy and their resources to taking care of the community here locally, like the Enough is Enough anti-bullying campaign. My bracelet here. <laughs> the Enough is Enough anti-bullying campaign because there was just a few too many suicides of LGBT youth, and of course LGBT youth are disproportionately bullied, or the ones who are perceived to be LGBT, disproportionately bullied. 
And so they step in. Because if you're an LGBT kid, you're my brother, and you're my sister, and I will carry you, and I will share the Lord. These aren't just people who care. These are people who know how to love. It makes me think of um, my mom recently um, is writing a book. It's almost ready for publication, so I hope she doesn't mind me quoting her <laughs> before it goes to publication. But it's just uh, too brilliant. It, it, it relates so strongly I couldn't resist. Um, and her book is, um, is about awakening to the suffering of others. It's a chronicle of awakening to the suffering of others. And it's an absolutely incredible book. I couldn't be prouder. She quotes throughout the book from various thinkers and writers. And one quote that I thought was particularly relevant here was from Jesus, again. And it's not a religious work or anything like that, but um, it's relevant. And Jesus, this embodiment of compassion, said that whatever you do to them, you did to me. And reflecting on that, my mother wrote, I hear these words as the truth of anyone who loves. And elsewhere in the book she writes, their suffering has become my suffering, their peace, my peace. I know no other way to love. And so that's the queer community. It's family. You're my brother, you're my sister, we are family. Your suffering is my suffering, your peace is my peace. I value you. I celebrate you. I recognize the beauty of you. I see you as you are. We know how to love. Next reason. We are honest. And I'll point out here too that not all of these apply to everyone. But uh, you know, there are also lots of negative things that I could be talking about here, but here I'm ta talking about why we walk. So these are reasons. And uh, just bear in mind, you know, just as they apply to people who aren't LGBT as well, to school. But, by and large, we are honest. That whole thing about I see you, that's only possible where there's truth. And love, that's only possible where there's truth. Truth is one of the things that LGBT people are best at. Who among us hasn't had to wrestle with the truth? Face the truth, resign ourselves to the truth. Yes, I'm trans. Yes, I pick my nose. So what? There are worse things, like pretending. Who among us hasn't had to risk everything for the truth? Most of us have paid a great price for honesty. And most of us know that truth is more important than the price we pay for it. In a world of playing, let's pretend Learning the lesson of truth is priceless. And for this category, I chose the song, Games People Play, which is a song that I love. And I wanted to read you a few of those lyrics. Oh, the games people play now, every night and every day now, never meaning what they say now, never saying what they mean. And they while away the hours in their ivory towers, so they're covered up with flowers in the back of a black limousine. People walking up to you, singing glory, hallelujah, and they're trying to sock it to you in the name of the Lord. Look around, tell me what you see. What's happening to you and me? God grant me the serenity to remember who I am. We LGBT folk, those of us who are out and proud, have given up playing those games. We know the value of honesty. We remember who we are. Next one. We have perspective. If 
for this one, I chose the song Both Sides Now. Looked at life from both sides now. Um, and the, the little uh, person that I, I put here is my drawing of a uh, first uh, of a um, two spirit person, which is the First Nations uh, term for people in their communities who are lesbian, gay, bi, and trans. They understand it all in one umbrella of being two spirit, of having elements of both the male and the female. Um, and I've also talked about how traditionally two spirit people have been revered in uh, First Nations culture until um, Europeans and colonists uh, interfered with that. Um, but traditionally this was an elevated status. They were regarded as having a privilege of seeing the world from two perspectives at once. And the value of this um, was appreciated. Uh, they were seen as people who have gifts to bring to a community, as leaders, as visionaries, healers, peacemakers. But it's not just two-spirit people who are gifted with valuable perspectives to bring to a community. Trans people generally are a bridge between the genders and bring the full spectrum of gender to light. Uh, gay and lesbian people, they upturn our rigid notions of what a healthy, loving relationship can look like. And like the line in the song, uh, Both Sides Now, tears and fears and feeling proud to say, I love you, right out loud. And I think that that's a valuable perspective, to appreciate what it means to be able to say, I love you, right out loud. Bisexuals bring yet another perspective, which is that sexual orientation is not so black and white as either or. Many, many, many people are capable of traction to both males and females. They bring the full spectrum of sexual orientation to light. Asexuals experience life outside of sexual attraction. And yes, there is a world beyond sex. However hard that is to believe in our hyper, hyper, hypersexualized society. This may be one of the most valuable and undervalued perspectives considering what a mess we've gotten ourselves into with the increasing rates of sexually transmitted infections, infidelities, crimes of passion, sexual violence, ever younger sexually active youth, unwanted pregnancies and abortions. Consider what you're left with if sex was taken out of the equation of relationship. Now, as many, most elderly couples eventually discover, is that then you're left with loving the person. You're left with faithfulness for its own sake. You're left with deep emotional ties that bind far more security than any physical connection. But these aren't prescriptions. This isn't to say that just because trans people are, have enormous value that everyone should be trans, or that because gay and lesbian people have enormous value, everyone should be gay, or bisexuals have enormous value, everyone should be bisexual, or because asexuals have enormous value, everyone should be asexual. These are simply perspectives that exist. And this ties into my earlier point about honesty, about remembering who I am. Because in knowing who we are, we bring ourselves as we are to the greater community. And as long as people are pretending, conforming, there can be no truth and no understanding. We can try to pretend that the whole world is heterosexual, cisgendered, and sexualized. But this is simply unrealistic. We are all pieces of a much greater puzzle. And to get the full picture, we need every piece, every perspective. LGBT folk are critical pieces, not only to the big picture of sexual and gender diversity, but to the complete human picture. And we would only add to our wealth to capitalize on the gifts that each of us bring. And we have inner perspective very human perspective. We've come face to face with human weakness. We've been humbled by life, freed from the illusions that plague those who belong to a dominant majority. We have intimate knowledge of how fear is manifested, the dangers of ignorance, 
the fragility of ideals and the constructions of belief? Tell me that this perspective isn't desperately needed. And a final point about perspective. In the song Both Sides Now, if you're familiar with it, she, just, she talks about, I've looked at life from both sides now, from up and down, from give and take, from win and lose, and still somehow, I really don't know life at all. Think about the meaning of that. I, I have. And it reminds me of the saying, the one who thinks he knows doesn't know what knowing is. The wise thing is to welcome and value every perspective, but to never be so foolish as to think that the picture is complete. The minute we form a concrete picture, it is dead. What is living is constantly growing, evolving, moving, changing. So keep on your toes. And be careful not to let your mind grow crusty with conclusions. And speaking of wise, this brings me to the next point, that we are wise. And that's just my little silly totem pole uh, drawing. As a revered, it was a joke, I hope nobody's offended, but the idea of trans people having been traditionally revered um, as having a, a wise perspective to bring is not a serious drawing. Uh, but we are wise. This comes with the territory of being open to every perspective. It comes with the territory of being humbled by experience. What wisdom is there to be found in an uneventful life? It comes with the territory of being honest. It comes with the territory of having suffered and of having overcome. And most importantly, it comes with the territory of knowing how to love. For this category, I chose the song uh, Wise Men Say, yeah, Only Fools Rush In. Wise men say only fools rush in, but I can't help falling in love with you. Shall I stay? Would it be a sin if I can't help falling in love with you? When Sharon and I first met, as I've told many times, uh, it was love at first sight. And at the time, I was uh, closeted and Christian and female. And I believed that homosexuality was a sin. Um, I had vowed to God that I would never be uh, in a relationship with somebody unless he gave me a great big sign to the contrary. And it was actually two weeks later that I met Sharon. But even then, I, I didn't know what to think of it. All of a sudden, I'm in love. What do I do about that? Sharon had no problem because, I mean, she had no notions, no beliefs whatsoever. So she thought I was just being silly. But I asked myself, would it be a sin? And how wise would I have been? If I had resisted love for the sake of what wise men say, it was in listening to love, not to the words of what wise men say, that I discovered wisdom. Love is wisdom. Truth is wisdom. And the pairing of the two is indomitable and unerring. There's a 19th century Scottish theologian, George MacDonald, my mother's favorite uh, author and theologian. And he has one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is that it is better to love a little than to understand everything. Or in the words of another author, Theodore Isaac Rubin, Kindness is more important than wisdom, and the recognition of this is the beginning of wisdom. And that, by the way, is the central quote to my mother's book about awakening to the suffering of others. All too often, LGBT folk experience rejection at the hands of people 
who think that they are making a wise choice in refusing to accept that which doesn't fit into their personal or spiritual ideology. Wisdom doesn't make choices. And wisdom has no ideology. Wisdom is the action of love. It is the consequence of truth. And it manifests always as kindness. As the Dalai Lama said, a man who most people would consider wise, be kind whenever possible. It is always possible. And LGBT people know how to be kind. Next one is that weird is good. And yes, I, uh, I used to look like that. But originally, uh, as I was preparing this presentation, I called this category, um, we don't judge. And then I thought, well, you know, the whole thing about judge not unless you be judged, and I wouldn't want to be judged. But unfortunately, even among LGBT folk, those who have too often been on the uh, receiving end of being judged, uh, too often they turn around and do judge others. Many gay and lesbian people don't get bisexuals. Many gay, lesbian people, and bisexuals don't get transsexuals, and on and on. So I thought about calling this category, who are we to judge? Because even though there will always be individual prejudices, prejudices and, uh, and ignorances, collectively, as a community, we do tend to adopt the view of live and let live and celebrate diversity. We really do. I don't care who you are or where you're from or what you did as long as you love them. And I don't care who you are or how you dress or how you present your gender. I wouldn't want to be judged on that. And honestly, after enough time, all of these things tend to fall into one great big sinkhole of who cares, who cares, who cares. But celebrating diversity is more than just not judging. It's about appreciating the full wonderfulness of it. Weird is good. And there is scientific proof of this. And I want to tell a story actually. Um, Maureen from LGBT Lanark County, uh, she and her partner have a farm, an organic farm, and from time to time I've spent time helping them out there, which is always uh, really, really enjoyable. Um, and Maureen, they're, they're experts in all kinds of growing veggies. But Maureen in particular is a real expert in potatoes. And I don't know how much you know about potatoes, but we tend to think of it as just like a white potato kind of thing. But there are many, 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 many varieties of potato. Purple and yellow and red and striped and you name it. Um, and she was, she was talking to me uh, one time over picking weeds or something about the Irish potato famine. And this happened in the, about the middle of the 19th century. Um, so over the course of seven years, seven year famine, uh, the potato crops were devastated, and a million uh, people in the country died of starvation, and another million uh, left the country because there was no food. And so the country's population was reduced by about 25%. And there were many reasons for this, economic, social, and such, but Maureen pointed out that the, that the main reason that this potato famine was so devastating was because they were growing one variety of potato in that country. Primarily one variety. And uh, when a blight was introduced, which is a, a disease, a plant disease, what happened? It spread across and just devastated all of the crops. Now, some varieties of potato would have resistance to certain diseases that others might not. And if they had been growing many varieties of potato, then it's likely that some of them would have developed a resistance or come with a resistance, they could have crossbred, they could have planted other varieties of potato, and there would not have been the devastation that there was. So be warned about the growing threat of monoculture. This same principle applies in the animal kingdom, and the same principle applies to human diversity. And I found a book called Diversity and Deviance, a Biological Perspective by a biologist named 
Paul Grubstein. And he writes, diversity is fundamental to life. It is essential to the success of any biological entity. Our survival continues to depend on our production and nurturing of variants. There is no way for us to predict which variants of the human species will be able to cope well in an unknown future environment. These characteristics make absolute nonsense of any argument which claims that human beings can be biologically ranked one against another. There is no biological sense to the words superior and inferior. And so, weird is good. We need it. We depend on it for our very survival as one species, as a society that is mutually independent on the variation that exists within it, and in preparation for an unknown. We, know, we don't know what may be coming, or what will prove to be valuable in the end. And for this category, I chose the song, Disney song, That's What Makes the World Go Round. Left and right, day and night, south and north, back and forth, for every up there is a down, for every square there is a round, for every high there is a low, for every two there is a fro, short and tall, large and small, thick and thin, lose and win, that's what makes the world go round. And there's scientific proof. Uh, so the next reason here being that we tell great stories. That's my little meat cow book. And this comes with the territory of having an eventful life, of living in interesting times. You show me the LGBT person who has lived an uneventful life, or whose story would be a dull one. Every life is a story, but everybody loves the most exciting, strange, adventurous, complex, unusual ones. Those are the books we love most. And so wouldn't it be nice if we treasured the people themselves as much as we would the story of their life? For this one, I chose the song Bohemian Rhapsody. And this is, I think this is a song that everybody loves. Certainly everybody knows the words, and the words are not easy. You know, a Scaramouche, and can you do the Fandango, and this is la, will you let me go, you know? Like, I can't, I don't know if you were here for it, but I actually skipped that whole part. It gets far too complex, key changes, and uh, tempo changes, and anyway, the wind blows kind of, kind of music. Very, very, very difficult. But we all know the words, and we can all sing along to it. And why? Because, I think, because it tells a fantastic story. An amazing story. It's a tragic story. It's an impassioned story. It's a rhapsody. Uh, and it was written by uh, a gay man, Freddie Mercury, who died of AIDS. And actually the song was written before he had contracted AIDS. But it did take on a much deeper meaning in that later context. Sends shivers down my spine, body's aching all the time. If I'm not here this time tomorrow, carry on, carry on. So needless to say, we all live interesting lives one way or another. And think about what we can gain by listening, really exercising that art of listening, and entering into the experiences of others. Having a great song to sing along to is the least of the benefits. Um, I was having a conversation a long while back with my sister, Vegan, and uh, we were talking about the experiences of, of LGBT people and the hardships and such and such, and actually how the kind of character that can be formed out of those kinds of experiences. And uh, she suddenly was got, got to thinking, like, wait a minute, what would happen if, if one day the whole world is fully accepting, fully affirming, and it's just nothing at all to be gay, lesbian, bi, trans, whatever? She's like, you'd all be just as boring as the rest of us. <laughs> and she's right. And it was almost like this epiphany, this, wait a minute, it is a good thing. Yes, it is a good thing, but we might actually lose something too. It's that conflict, isn't it? And I think that that goes back to the importance of not drawing conclusions. Would it be better if we didn't have to struggle? Or is Nietzsche right to wish hardship on others? I don't know. Uh, I was watching a, a documentary about a woman who has this debilitating disease, uh, which is that her bones don't stop growing. All of her bones just continue to grow and grow and create more and more bone growth. 
is that over the course of her life, she is becoming increasingly locked in her body, locked literally by her skeletal structure. And you can imagine the challenges that come with this. And she was asked in the documentary if there was some magical cure, or if, if she could have been born without this disease, would she wish it? She thought about it and she said no. She said, it's made me who I am. This is who I am. If I did, if I wasn't this, I don't know who I would be. I wouldn't be me. And I couldn't help but thinking about that as it applied to me. Would I have wished uh, that I hadn't been trans? Would I have wished to have just been born into a body that I felt was right? And then not to not have had the difficulties and the hardships and the experiences that I've had. And um, my answer would be the same, no. Because I don't know then who I would be. I wouldn't be me. This is who I am. So I think that one of the important points about this here is uh, to learn to love your story and to learn to love everyone else's. And then finally, the last point being that we know the value of happiness at Sharon on the day I met her. How rare is the genuine discovery of the importance of happiness? And again, what does the uneventful life know of happiness? Happiness is hard one. Like love, it takes a tremendous effort. Like truth, it involves tremendous risk. The quality of happiness, like the quality of the view at the top of the mountain, increases with what you have invested into reaching it. When Sharon and I were um, early on in our relationship, we took a trip off to Australia without any particular intention of returning, although we did a month later. Um, and we went hiking off into the northern mountains um, with the tent backpacks and we would hike for days and days just to get away to experience maybe one day of our lives to see nothing human other than each other I'm not sure we ever actually accomplished that we're everywhere in some form or another including railroads but the thing about this trip Australia is hot and the rainforests are and we had a, a few provisions of food, and we had shelter, and we had some water. But all of that trip, all of our hiking, days and days, uh, it was every single moment of every day wondering where will our next water source come from. Food was secondary, shelter was secondary, money and all kinds of things like that didn't even, it wasn't even on the radar. It was water. And there were some close calls, <laughs> but we managed to find water along the way each time that we, we needed it. Um, and I remember afterwards when we got to a hostel in a, in a town, taking a shower after many, many days with them, and just that sense that I had, I remember it like it was yesterday, all of that water, 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 and water, and flowing, flowing, and I'm trying to hold it in my hands because all of a sudden, the way I saw water hadn't completely changed. I saw the, the preciousness of it. I knew, I saw that it was life itself. And those who have been starved of family, friends, communities, jobs, dreams of what your life will be, as so many of us LGBT people have experienced, and then to have a taste of happiness, you know that it is life itself. So those who would take happiness away from us, deny us our families, our friendships, our communities, our quality of life, our dignity, those who would take away or deny happiness to someone else, this is among the worst forms of violence. It is living murder. 
What matters is life and quality of life. And you can't have quality of life without truth, love, and happiness. And for this category, I chose a song, Color My World. And among the lyrics, it says, You'll never see a dark cloud hanging round me. Now there is only blue sky to surround me. There's never been a gray day since you found me. Everything I touch is turning to gold. So you can color my world with sunshine yellow each day. You can color my world with happiness all the way. Just take the green from the grass and the blue from the sky up above. And if you color my world, just paint it with your love. Just color my world. Just as long as I know you're thinking of me, there will be a rainbow always up above me. Since I found the one who really loves me, everything I touch is turning to gold. Sunshine, yellow, orange, blossom, laughing faces everywhere. And I wonder, is it a coincidence that ours is a rainbow flag? Is it a coincidence that the word gay means happy? Is it coincidence that finding the one who really loves you colors your world? The spectrum of light, the spectrum of color, the spectrum of diversity, rainbows, love, and happiness, all very suspiciously connected. So, taking a look at the reasons why we rock just because we have suffered, we have overcome, we know how to love, we are honest, we have perspective, we are wise, weird is good, we tell great stories, and we know the value of happiness. You can check my math, but if you add these up, I'm pretty sure it equals we rock. <laughs> and it's not just LGBT folk, but anybody who fits this equation rocks. And that's the rainbow connection. And one bonus reason why we rock is that most of us dance, which is what we're going to be doing tonight. I hope to see you all there, and have a happy, happy pride, and rock on.